Now, I'm holding you in contempt of court. Oh, it is a f***ing surprise. What'd you say? <laughs> what? What'd you just say? Don't talk back to the judge. Quit while you're ahead. Or quit while you're slightly behind. This movie is so great. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. All right, animated. Smile more. Today we are covering My Cousin Vinny, one of my favorite legal movies of all time. And if there is one question I get more than any other, it is... What are you wearing? Indochino. Let me try that again. If there is one comment that I get more than any other, it's whether my cousin Vinny is in fact legally accurate. It's certainly a favorite among lawyers. We quote this movie all the time. What is a ute? So be sure to comment in the form of an objection, which will either sustain or overrule, and stick around until the end of the video where I give my cousin Vinny a grade for legal realism. So without further ado, let's dig in to my cousin Vinny. Uh oh, come on, his lights are on. What are we gonna do now? It's probably nothing, all right? Might be a tail light or something. Just relax. We don't have any money for bail. Bail? We don't need money for bail. Nothing's happened now. Just relax. Nothing. We're getting pulled over, aren't we? We stole you... something, didn't we? You're finished. You... Shut up. Oh, I forgot some background here that actually helps explain the rest of this movie. The movie starts with two kids from New York who are driving through the South. Uh, they stop at a grocery store called the Sack O' Suds to pick up some supplies, and they accidentally leave with a can of tuna in their pocket without paying for it. Uh, they think that when the police pull them over, they're being pulled over for uh, accidentally shoplifting a can of tuna, when in fact, the store manager was murdered just after they left the store. Okay, so with that background, that will make the rest of this movie make a lot more sense. Show me your hands! Jesus. Show me your hands! Get them up! Get them up! Up! Now put your hands on top of your head and get out of the car! Out of the car! All right, so this is a case of mistaken identity, but it's important to note that when a policeman stops your car, it's generally considered a seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes. So generally speaking, the police may not stop your car unless they have at least reasonable suspicion to believe that the law has been violated. Provided that the police have lawfully stopped the vehicle, the officer can order the occupants to get out in the name of officer safety. Here, all of those requirements are met. We have a murder that was conducted by people driving a very similar car who fit the description of the defendants here. So it's very likely that the police did in fact have probable cause to stop this car and were correct in ordering the occupants to get out of the car because of the grisly nature of the murder that just happened nearby. Yeah, 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 I'm sure it's number three and five. Ridiculous, all this over a can of tuna. Keep quiet. Okay, so that was a classic police lineup. There are a couple problems here. A defendant can attack the identification as denying due process when the identification, the lineup itself, is unnecessarily suggestive and there is a substantial likelihood of misidentification. If we roll the clip back, we can see that the two defendants here look nothing like the rest of the people in the lineup. They are several feet shorter and far skinnier. Also, additionally, both of them are in the lineup at the same time. Time. And that is likely to be unnecessarily suggestive and to create a false positive, which is exactly what happened here. Well, a proven attorney from out of state is a pretty informal matter. I just have a few questions. Yeah, cool. This is a real thing. It's a motion called a Pro Hoc Vice motion where an out of state attorney wants to uh, have temporary permission to practice in a state that they aren't licensed. Usually you have to be sponsored by another attorney, but you always have to vouch and say that you are going to follow the laws of that state and jurisdiction when you apply. How long have you been practicing? Oh, about uh, six, uh, almost 16 years. Any murder cases? Lots of, quite a few, yes. What was the outcome? Uh, you know, win some, lose some. <laughs> Never a good idea to lie to a judge. The judge will find out eventually and you can be sanctioned both in the state that you are uh, trying to get into, but also the state that you come from as well. <clears throat> Mr. Gambini, stand up. <laughs> Not again. Now, didn't I tell you the next time you appear in my courtroom that you dress appropriately? You were serious about that? <laughs> Again, 
wear an actual suit and tie when you go to court. I really wish I could tell Joe Pesci where I get all of my suits from. Indochino. What's all that? Trotter's files, all of them. You stole his files? I didn't steal his files. Listen to this. I'm just ready to finesse him. I'm starting to finesse him, right? I got him going. He offers to have his secretary copy everything for me. That's very impressive, finessing. Yeah, in reality, the reason that the prosecution would turn over materials to the defense is they have a constitutional obligation to do so. The government has a duty to disclose materials, certainly all exculpatory evidence, but generally that translates to all of the material that the prosecution has uh, under Supreme Court precedence, uh, specifically the 1963 case of Brady versus Maryland. Failure to disclose that evidence, whether willful or inadvertent, is a due process violation. So the prosecutor here was constitutionally obligated to turn over his files to Joe Pesci. He had nothing to do with his schmoozing. Uh, and to not do so would be what's called a Brady violation and could have resulted in overturning the conviction if he was able to get a conviction. Don't you want to know why Trotter gave you his files? I told you why already. He has to. By law, you're entitled. It's called disclosure, you <laughs> dickhead. Hey, I just said that. Nice job, Marissa Tomei. He has to show you everything, otherwise it could be a mistrial. He has to give you a list of all his witnesses. You can talk to all his witnesses. He's not allowed any surprises. Yep. Gone are the days of trying to ambush either party at trial. Prosecution has to turn over not only their evidence, but as part of the pretrial filings, you have to disclose who the witnesses are that you're going to rely on so that no one is sandbagged when they actually get to trial. That doesn't help anyone. They didn't teach you that in law school either? Guess not. Are you mocking me with that outfit? Mocking you? No, I'm not mocking you, Judge. Then explain that outfit. I bought a suit. You've seen it. Now it's covered in mud. This town doesn't have a one-hour cleaner, so I had to buy a new suit. Except that the only store you could buy a new suit in has got the flu. You get that? The whole store got the flu. So I had to get this in a second-hand store. Joe Pesci could really use a place where he could get affordable custom-made suits so he could actually have more than one suit when he shows up to court for a capital murder case. Indochino.com, promo code Legal Eagle. I think you made your point. In all seriousness, he probably would have been better off wearing his actual normal suit covered in mud. I've actually known lawyers who will purposefully scuff up their suits so that they seem more approachable by the jury. You on drugs? Drugs? No, I don't take drugs. I don't like your attitude. What else is no? I'm holding you in contempt of court. Oh, there's a f***ing surprise. What'd you say? <laughs> what? What'd you just say? Don't talk back to the judge. Quit while you're ahead. Or quit while you're slightly behind. This movie is so great. Counsel, members of the jury, the evidence in this case is going to show that at 9.30 in the morning of January 4th, both defendants, Stanley Rothenstein and William Gambini, were seen getting out of there Metallic green 1964 Buick Skylark convertible with a white top. The evidence is going to show that they were seen entering the Sackersuds convenience store in Wazoo City. The evidence is going to show that minutes after they entered the Sackersuds, a gunshot was heard by three eyewitnesses. You're going to then hear the testimony of the three eyewitnesses who saw the defendants running out of the Sackersuds a moment after the shots were heard getting into their faded metallic green 1964 Buick Skylark and driving off in great haste. All right, I really, really, really like the prosecutor's opening statement in this movie. There are a couple things that he's doing that actually rarely happen correctly in the movies. Number one, this prosecutor is giving a short summary of what the evidence will show. Opening statements are about essentially priming the jury for the story that is going to be elicited through the evidence and through the witnesses. So this prosecutor is doing a fantastic job of explaining what the evidence will show. On top of that, this prosecutor is doing a great job of using the space in front of the jury, uh, while also at the same time maintaining a respectful distance away from the jury box. 
if you enter the well and go straight to the area right in front of the jury, the judge is going to have a huge problem with that. But I like that he starts at counsel table, talks about what the evidence is going to show, and specifically to highlight the testimony of a specific witness, he then walks over towards the witness stand and gestures to where the testimony is going to come from. So he is being dramatic and somewhat theatrical, but within the bounds of what someone would actually do in a way that makes rhetorical sense. Counselor, you wish to make an open statement? <laughs> Counselor. I have never seen lead trial counsel fall asleep at counsel table, but I have 100% seen other attorneys who are at counsel table fall asleep. I've seen members of the jury fall asleep during the trial. I've seen people in the gallery fall asleep at, at trial. I've actually seen a bailiff fall asleep in a trial once. A lot of the trial process is actually pretty boring and mundane, and it's not uncommon to see people fall asleep, just not the head trial counsel. Uh, everything that guy just says Thank you. In addition to being vulgar and disrespectful to the court, that's technically an argument and not allowed as your opening statement. Mr. Tipton, when you viewed the defendants walking from their car into the sack of suds, what angle was your point of view? They was kind of walking toward me when they entered the store. And when they left, what angle was your point of view? They was kind of walking away from me. So would you say you got a better shot at them going in and not so much coming out? You could say that. I did say that. Would you say that? Yeah. This is really good. The testimony was ambiguous, and so Joe Pesci here follows up and confirms that the witness does in fact agree with the statement that Joe Pesci has said. That is a very crucial thing that a lot of lawyers miss. It's so easy when you're in the heat of cross-examination that you just assume that the testimony is what you think it is, when in reality, we're really unreliable narrators. So it's a great idea to make sure and summarize and get the uh, witness to actually state exactly what it is you want them to prove. And on top of that, when you're getting good testimony, it's a great idea to get the witness to repeat the thing that is actually good for you. So great job by Joe Pesci here so far. Is it possible to two Utes? Uh, uh, to what? <laughs> uh -oh, what was that word? Uh, what word? To what? What? Did you say Utes? Yeah, two Utes. What is a Ute? <laughs> Excuse me, Your Honor. Two Utes. That's great because, again, in the heat of cross-examination, sometimes people slur their words. Sometimes the court reporter can't take down exactly what was said, where people kind of talk over each other. So it is a real thing where the judge or particularly the stenographer will actually stop the testimony to clarify. And of course, this is probably the most classic scene in the entire movie. And it's, it's just hilarious because there's a kernel of truth in it. Is it possible the two defendants entered the store, picked 22 specific items off of the shelves, had the clerk take money, make change, then leave. Then two different men drive up in a similar... Don't shake your head, I'm not done yet. Wait till you hear the whole thing so you can understand this now. Two different men drive up in a similar looking car, go in, shoot the clerk, rob him, and then leave? No, they didn't have enough time. Well, how much time was they in the store? Five minutes. Five minutes? Are yeah. you sure? Did you look at your watch? No. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. You testified earlier that the boys went into the store and you had just begun to make breakfast. You were just ready to eat and you heard a gunshot. That's, That's right. right, I'm sorry. So obviously it takes you five minutes to make breakfast. That's right. Right, so you knew that. Uh, do you remember what you had? Eggs and grits. So Joe Pesci is being a little bit argumentative here, but what he's doing is he is setting a factual and logical trap for the witness to show that the witness doesn't have the kind of veracity or truthfulness that would be necessary to convict for beyond a reasonable doubt. If you can show that a witness is lying or can't be trusted on one thing, members of the jury are far less likely to believe them on most of the rest of their testimony. That can be really, really important for disproving the testimony of an eyewitness. Instant grits? No self-respecting southerner uses instant grits. I take pride in my grits. 
So, Mr. Tipton, how could it take you five minutes to cook your grits when it takes the entire grit-eating world 20 minutes? So it's a great question because there's no good answer for the witness. And additionally, it relies on facts, not in evidence, that grits actually take 20 minutes. In real life, you would have had to have this witness establish that grits take 20 minutes to cook. So you gotta be really, really careful when you're doing a tactic like what Joe Pesci is doing. And it can work out, but it's very, very dangerous on cross because you don't know which way it's gonna go. What are these pictures of? My house and stuff. House and stuff. And uh, what is this brown stuff on the windows? Dirt. Dirt? What is this rusty, dusty, dirty looking thing over your window? It's a screen. A screen. It's a screen. And what are these really big things right in the middle of your view from the window of your kitchen to the sack of suds? What do we call these big things? <laughs> Trees? I absolutely love what Joe Pesci is doing right here. He is using effectively incontrovertible evidence. No one's gonna dispute what these things are in the photos, but he is walking the witness down a logical path that he's not going to be able to get out of, which is that there's a lot of stuff between his vantage point and the events that he is an eyewitness to. This is one of the reasons why direct evidence through eyewitness testimony can be actually very, very unreliable. But what Joe Pesci is doing is he is just having the witness agree to just these tiny little facts. And there's no way to dispute all of the little breadcrumbs he's getting on his trail to get to the ultimate conclusion that his eyewitness testimony is not really that believable. So the questions are fantastic. The only thing I would have liked to have seen is a projector or an Elmo that displays these photos in, uh, in blow up so that the jury can also see exactly what it is that the witness is referring to. You could positively identify the defendants for a moment of two seconds, looking through this dirty window, this crud covered screen, these trees with all these leaves on them and I don't know how many bushes. It was like five. Uh -uh. Don't forget this one and this one. Seven bushes. Seven bushes. So, what do you think? Is it possible you just saw two guys in a green convertible and not necessarily these two particular guys? Well, I suppose. And what you see here is that the answer that the witness provides, it doesn't matter. The witness here can agree or the witness cannot agree. But the sign of a good cross is that you don't actually care what the witness is going to say. In fact, if he had said that it was a perfect identification, he would have lost credibility based on all of the things that Joe Pesci just talked about here. So that is the sign of a masterful cross-examination. I would recommend all lawyers watch this particular cross-examination of this witness. This is the best so far. I'm a special automotive instructor of forensic studies for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh-huh. How long have you been in that position? 18 years. Your Honor, uh, may we approach the bench, please? If you wish. object to this witness being called at this time. We've been given no prior notice he'd testify, no discovery of any tests he's conducted or reports he's prepared, and as the court is aware, the defense is entitled to advance notice of any witness who will testify, particularly those who will give scientific evidence so that we could properly prepare for cross-examination, as well as to give the defense an opportunity to have the witness's reports reviewed by a defense expert who might then be in a position to contradict the veracity of his conclusions. The prosecution here has made a huge mistake, which is they haven't laid the foundation for how this guy is a credible expert who can testify in court. So there's really only two kinds of witnesses. There are lay witnesses who can only testify to things that they actually perceive. And then there are experts who are allowed to testify to their opinions on things based on the evidence presented to them. And under rule 702 of the rules of procedure, the expert has to have scientific, technical, or specialized 
has knowledge that will help the trier of fact. Uh, the testimony has to be based on sufficient facts or data. The testimony has to be the product of reliable principles and methods. And the expert has to have reliably applied the principles and methods to the case at hand. So on top of uh, FRE 702, you also have to meet the Daubert standard, which is meant to give the court the gatekeeping function to prevent junk science from getting into the court. There is no way that these tire marks were made by a 64 Buick Skylark. These marks were made by a 1963 Pontiac Tempest. Objection, Your Honor. Can we clarify to the court whether the witness is stating opinion or fact? This is your opinion? It's a fact. I find it... It's actually opinion. ...that this kind of information could be ascertained simply by looking at a picture. Would you like me to explain? I would love to hear this. <laughs> the car that made these two equal length tire marks had positive traction. Can't make those marks without positive traction, which was not available on the 64 Buick Skylark. And why not? What is positive traction? It's a limited slip differential which distributes power equally to both the right and left tires. The 64 Skylark had a regular differential, which anyone who's been stuck in the mud in Alabama knows. You step on the gas, one tire spins, the other tire does nothing. Oh, uh, so good. This is a great direct examination by Joe Pesci and great testimony by Marissa Tomei. Unlike in cross-examination, where the attorney is the star and the witness's answers are almost irrelevant, it's the absolute opposite on direct examination. There, you want all eyes on the witness and all you're doing is asking questions that allow the witness to expand and you're softly guiding where you want the witness to go. Uh, Joe Pesci's questions are fantastic. Essentially, what happened next? Or can you explain why that is? What is that technical term that you just used? He's using great open-ended questions. He's not leading her anywhere. And he is letting the witness be the star. Now. In the 60s, there were only two other cars made in America that had positive traction and independent rear suspension and enough power to make these marks. One was the Corvette, which could never be confused with the Buick Skylark. The other had the same body length, height, width, weight, wheelbase, and wheel track as the 64 Skylark, and that was the 1963 Pontiac Tempest. And because both cars were made by GM, were both cars available in metallic mint green paint? They were. Thank you, Ms. Vito. No more questions. Thank you very, very much. You've been a lovely, lovely witness. It's probably not appropriate, but God, it's a perfect scene. How can you just not love that direct examination and Marissa Tomei's expert opinion? Fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, that was My Cousin Vinny. Now it's time to give the movie a grade for legal realism. I have a soft spot in my heart for this movie. It's so good. Everyone should absolutely see it. If you've never seen it before, I hope I didn't ruin it. First of all, you have Joe Pesci giving a masterful cross-examination and a masterful direct examination that frankly, you could take those clips and use them to teach trial advocacy in law school. You have some motion practice and some civil procedure that is not 100% accurate, but pretty close. Of course, as a comedy, they take license with a few things. Joe Pesci is floundering around, making huge mistakes, but it sort of fits the narrative because he's supposed to be a really terrible attorney who just got out of law school at the beginning of this movie. And there's some shenanigans with experts being allowed when they shouldn't be and lying to the judge, but it's done in such a way that it has a grain of truth to it. So it's hard for me to get over just how good this movie is because it's a fantastic comedy, it's a good drama, and it's a nice work of legal fiction. So. I don't see how I can give My Cousin Vinny anything less than an A. It's so good. Go watch this movie. The defense rests. Vincent Gambini really screwed up by not wearing a proper suit to court. It's hard to overstate the value of a great suit. All of my suits are now custom made by Indochino. I buy them with my own money. I love their stuff so much, I personally reached out to them. Here's the secret to a great suit. 
Fit matters more than anything. And the only way to get a suit that fits right is to get it custom. In the past, that has been unbelievably expensive. But Indochino allows you to make a fully custom suit for a ridiculous price, often less than $400. I don't know how they do it, but their suits use the best materials and are perfectly tailored. I will never get an off-the-rack suit again. I've had trouble with made-to-measure suits in the past because I couldn't get the measurements right. But with Indochino, I just walked into the store and got the full attention of a stylist for over an hour. What's up, Andrew? He took my measurements, and a couple of weeks later, I got the best fitting suit of my entire life. It was perfect right out of the box. Legal Eagles can get any premium Indochino suit for just $3.79 when you enter the promo code Legal Eagle at checkout, or use the link in the description. Clicking the link really helps out this channel. That's Indochino.com promo code Legal Eagle for the best custom suit of your entire life. Did you fall in your place or somebody else's? My place. So, do you agree? Leave your objections in the comments and check out my other Real Lawyer reactions over here where I will see you in court.